Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Good to have Haley filling in for us as Miss Barbara's gone this week. But uh, let's get into our worship this morning. Y'all stand with me if, if you can. And uh, our first song this morning will be out of the Heavenly Highways hymnal. Uh, Jerry should have it up on the monitor for us. It's uh, I'll Fly Away, 54 in the Heavenly Highway hymnal. We'll sing all three verses. <coughs> to speak to yet this morning. Let's shake some hands, hug some necks, make everyone feel welcome here this morning.
Good morning, church family. Good morning. Wow, y'all sound like y'all just got back from camp, and I know all of y'all didn't go. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was a little still weak, but we'll, we'll go with it. Hey, listen, if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here to worship our Savior today. We're glad to have you be a part of our church family. Uh, I'm not going to do any announcements this morning. I'm going to encourage you to read your bulletins because I want to spend a little time talking about camp, and we have a, a presentation or two to make, so... I uh, just want to spend a little time. First of all, I want to say thank you to our church family who sent us uh, through your generous giving. Uh, we were able to pay for all the kids to go, and, and we just had a great time at camp this week. It was hot, lots of long days, but God was good, and, and so you're going to see some of that in just a moment. I put together a little slideshow for you. Uh, also, want to give a special thanks to uh, Mark and Jerry for driving us up there. Uh, special thanks to Tori and Molly and Tabitha, Wesley and Haley for coming as counselors as they gave up their time and their efforts to invest in these kids. Uh, most of all, I thank our living Savior who was there present among us as his spirit was alive and active uh, in our group and we had some kids make decisions, so we give him praise and glory for that. Uh, so I just want to give you a little glimpse of this week. Uh, it's accompanied with a song that we learn uh, during our worship time and I, I hope you enjoy that. So Jerry, you can go ahead and start.
best part of that video to me was Jake's signature shot. Uh, the Lord was just moving in our group, and it was just amazing to see and a, really a privilege to be a part of. And, and so what I'd like to do, you see, we're commissioned as a church to go into all the world and we're to preach the gospel, and that's a part of it. But it doesn't say to make converts. What does it say? Make disciples. And so, church, now the job begins. We have to come alongside these children and to disciple them and to help them grow in their faith and to help them along their journey and to be committed to praying for them because they're back in the real world now. And they're going to face trials and temptations and struggles that they didn't experience at camp. And so we as a church need to be committed to that. And what I want to do is invite the kids that were able to come this morning that made decisions to come up front. So Joshua and Evelyn, uh, Caleb, who else is here? Gabe, Sebastian. Am I missing anybody that's here? Y'all come up front. Like now, you can stand up and start walking. It's okay. I think that's everybody that's here that made a decision. If you are able to and, and feel okay to do so, y'all just stay down there. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I wasn't clear on that. If y'all would come up, I want us to surround these kids and pray over them uh, right now as a church family. And uh, let's commit ourselves to them. Let's commit ourselves to the Lord and discipling them and undergirding them as they journey on this walk of faith now, okay? So if you can come, you want to, you come now. feel led to pray over these kids, please do so, and then when I feel the ample time uh, gone, then I'll, I'll close our time together here. My heart is full. 
Lord, when I think of your love and your grace and your mercy that you so freely give us when we're so completely lacking and being deserving of that. God, I thank you for your spirit and how he was with us during this week at camp. And Lord, how the power of the spirit drew these young people to you. God, as they heard the truth of your word, as they heard the gospel presented, Lord, and as they felt conviction, uh, Lord, over their sin, and the way they were living their lives, Lord, and they, they decided that, Lord, even though they're not deserving, they know that you made the sacrifice, you made the way for them, and, and so they came to you, Lord, and they surrendered their lives and their hearts to live for Jesus, and so, Lord, I, I pray that as a church, Lord, we understand that the enemy is not going to like these decisions. And so, Lord, I pray first and foremost that we would get on our knees before you on behalf of these kids. God, that we would undergird them in prayer. Lord, as they now face a battle that's not for their flesh, but for their soul. God, that we could pray strength over them. Lord, that we could help train them and teach them what it means to now walk out this faith, pleasing to the Lord. God, that we could invest time and energy into equipping them with the truth that they need, the word of the living God. Father, I just thank you so much for your saving grace. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thank you how you gave us the provision of safe travel to camp. And, and Lord, that while we were there, you were with us. You spoke to us. I thank you for the speakers that you brought to camp. Lord, for John and for Heath and for Key. And Lord, their willingness to surrender to that call and to come and, and not bring man's opinion and not bring a bunch of fluff, but God, to bring the word of God that is powerful, that is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide even joint and marrow, to dissect and discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Lord, and as that was accomplished, as the sword was wielded, Lord, the students responded. Father, I pray over them, Lord, that you would empower them by, their, by your spirit, be able to do all things in Christ Jesus who gives them the strength. To be able to stand against the enemy. To take up the faith. The shield of faith that can quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. God, but they would know that they don't walk this out alone. That you walk it with them, Lord. But also that we as their church family stand behind them and walk with them as well. Father, I give you all the praise and glory for what you accomplished. And Lord, I'm just so humbled to have been a part of it. I, I go there thinking that I'm going to try to be a blessing, Lord, and it's I that am blessed. Thank you for that gift. It's in the holy and beautiful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Summer 2016 church camp is near. And we need to take time to realize, you know, thank y'all adults a little bit. It wasn't just the people funding us that helped. It was also the adults who took off from their jobs and their regular lives to come with us and make it possible for us to have counselors and leaders to guide us while we felt that. So, you know, on behalf of all the kids, I think y'all deserve a special thing.
start by introducing Miss uh, Victoria. Miss Victoria had a birthday this week. Anybody else celebrate a Victoria? Oh. A victory this week? Anybody else celebrate a birthday this week? Let's sing happy birthday to Miss Victoria. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Sing it more. What about anniversaries? Anybody celebrate an anniversary this week? No anniversaries? Let's get back into our song service this morning. 187 in the hymnal, in the garden. Y'all stand with me. Sing the uh, all three verses on this one. second and last verse on this one. How great thou art. Number 10.
we come to you today and thanking you for another opportunity to come to your house to worship you, Lord. Pray that you would uh, bless this offering and this intended gift, Lord. Bless the giver, Lord, for, for you know that. And, uh, Lord, I just uh, pray to you, Brother Jonathan, for your friends and nephews, Lord. To give them the things that they touch everyone here. We thank you for Jesus. Pray with me this morning. Father, I, uh, Lord, I, I just stand and marvel at your word and, and, Lord, just how cohesive it is. Father, I, I thank you that we have this opportunity and this privilege, God, to look into it and to mine out the treasures and to dig deep and, Lord, to, I pray by the power of your spirit, have greater understanding as you lead us into all truth. Father, I pray that, that these truths that we hear about today would become, uh, Lord, our battle cry and our heart's desire, and, and that, Lord, that this would be true of us individually, but us as, as your family, your bride here at Union Baptist Church, and that, God, we would seek you with all that we are and desire you above all else. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his sacrifice for his love, for his mercy, and his grace. I thank you, Lord, for the spirit and, and the strength that he endows us with as he comes to dwell in us, making it possible for us to even understand and be obedient to these truths. Father, I pray that you are glorified and honored during this time now. It's in the beautiful name of Christ that I pray. I ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 6 once more. Uh, we began this study last week. We're going to do a, a small review and then go on to the next part of it. But, but we're looking at the, the Sermon on the Mount, the sermon that Jesus preached the moment he came back from the wilderness after having been led there by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And then once he does that, he begins his earthly ministry. And the first thing that he does is he goes 
uh, to this place that was the mount and it, it's called the Sermon on the Mount and he begins this sermon with what we refer to as the Beatitudes and so Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 is, is one of these and, and he says here in this verse, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. So as we're looking at what Jesus is saying here and last week we, we covered the hunger aspect of that, we're going to take a little time to review, but, but he says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so when he uses these terms, hunger and thirsting, he's talking about an intense longing. And we talked last week about how if you had been just like Jesus was in the wilderness where he had gone 40 days and 40 nights without what? Food. And it says there that he was hungry. So by a show of hands, if you went 40 days with no food, would you be hungry? Everybody should have their hands up because otherwise you're a liar. You would be very hungry. If you go 40 days without food, you're very hungry. So you're going to have an intense longing for what? Food. You're going to have an intense longing. Your body is going to crave and desire to have food. He goes on to say, blessed are they that are hunger and thirst. And so when we think about being thirsty, going 40 days without water, what would you desire? What would you have an intense longing for? Water. You would want something to drink. Now, I can speak in smaller terms of this with our time at camp this week. We would get up, or I would get up, I should say, at 5.30. Then I'd wake Caleb up and Ben up at about 6.15 to get in the shower. Then we'd get ready. We'd go to eat breakfast. And then after that, we were just out in the hot sun until about 11.30 at night when it was lights out. And so when you're out there all day that long in the heat of the day, you're going to get thirsty. And so we made a couple trips to Walmart to buy bottles of water. But the problem was, no matter how many times I would take a bottle of water and drink of it, what would happen? Sweat it out. What else would happen? I'd be thirsty again, right? I, I would need it again, even though I had an intense longing for the water and for the drink. Even if I drank more than one bottle, or I'd have four or five in a day, it didn't matter how much I would drink of it, I would always want and need more. But look at what Jesus says. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Another version of that says they will be filled. There will be no end to their satisfaction. There will be no end to their Feeling. So he's talking about a hunger and a thirst and intense longing that for something that if we partake of it, we are going to be filled. We're going to be satisfied and we are not going to be hungry any longer. We're not going to be thirsty any longer. And so when we take and eat in the physical, if I'm hungry now and I eat now, I will be satisfied for now. But something's going to occur later. That's going to process through my body and I'm going to get what? Hungry again. And I'm going to have to take and eat again. And it's just this endless cycle. Same thing for thirst. And so Jesus is saying there's something that we can partake of that is both food and water. That if we partake of this thing, we will never thirst or hunger again. That's what he's referring to here in this sermon. He's saying, blessed are you. You will be blessed. Do you know what it means to be blessed? Yes, no, no, yes. Yeah. What does it mean to be blessed? It means to be full of joy. To be blessed means to have fullness of joy. And so we would be full of joy because we've hungered and thirst. We've had this intense longing for something that satisfies us, that fills us and meets all the needs and requirements that we have. And so what does he say that we should hunger and thirst for? He says righteousness. And so what kind of righteousness are we should, should we be longing for intently and intensely? Should it be our own righteousness? Lindsay had it right. She was the only one. I think B.R. maybe said no, and the rest of you all failed the test. No, we shouldn't desire and have an intense longing for righteousness that is of ourselves. Why? Because the word of God says that our righteousness is filthy rags. And I think I've shared the, the literal meaning of that with you before. And I know there's some children in here, so I won't get too graphic. But it literally means a menstrual rag. Now, as a man, I don't know of anything else that's grosser than that. But that's our righteousness. That's what we can produce that's good in us. It's equated to a menstrual rag, something that's dirty and unclean. So what kind of righteousness should we be longing for? What should we be hungering and thirsting for? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. Again, we looked at this last week, but in, in Matthew 6, 33, this is what Jesus says. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So if we're going to hunger and thirst for a righteousness that is going to satisfy, that it's going to fill us, whose righteousness are we hungering and thirsting for? Jesus. His righteousness. God's righteousness. That's what we're going after. That's what we're clinging to and intensely longing for. He says if you do that, if you partake of that, you will be satisfied. So last week we dealt with the bread. We, we talked about hunger, and so if you're hungry, you're going to eat bread. The, the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus having not eaten, he's hungry in Matthew chapter 4. The devil comes to him and says, hey, I know you're hungry, and I know who you are, and so what you should do is turn these stones to bread. And so Jesus says, man shall not live on earthly bread alone, not on bread that's of this world, but on what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what is this word? Who is this word? Well, in John chapter 1, it says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then later on, I don't remember verse 12 or 13, somewhere in there, it says the word became flesh. Who's that talking about? Jesus. So in the beginning, Jesus was the word. He was with God the Father, and he was God, and he became flesh, and he dwelled among us. And then later on, as we, we looked at it last week in, in John, uh, I think it was chapter 6 or so, I don't remember exactly, but Jesus refers to himself as the what? The bread of life. And he gives us the example from those wandering in the wilderness. He takes us back into the Old Testament where Moses is leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, and while they're there, they're wandering, they have no supplies, and God rains down manna from heaven, bread from heaven for them to eat of. And he says that your fathers ate of this bread, but it was the bread of heaven that is the one that's going to satisfy, that's going to fill, that's never going to let you down, that's never going to leave you hungry, is who? Who is the bread of life? Jesus. Jesus claims of himself, I am the bread of life. If you take of me, you will never hunger again. So if we're blessed because we have an intense longing, we have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are we having a hunger and thirst for ultimately? Jesus. He is our righteousness. He is the righteousness of God and he is the bread of life. So look at it this way. Full of joy are you if you have intense longing for Jesus because you will be satisfied. You will be satiated. You will be full and you will never hunger or thirst again. He is all inclusive and all encompassing. So he says that he's the bread of life. Now we're going to look at what it means to thirst. But before we get to that, let's turn to Jeremiah 2. I kind of like what uh, Pastor Heath did at camp when he would turn to a passage of scripture. He says, now is that in the Old or New Testament? Wow, y'all are worse than the kids, man. They knew how to answer that thing. Old, it's in the Old Testament. He's a prophet of God. I'm just trying to bring some camp here to y'all, and y'all are just failing miserably. Jeremiah 2, we're going to begin in verse 11. So we go back into the Old Testament. We're reading from a prophet of God. The prophet is going to show some things that are going on in the life of Israel. And friends, this is going to be true of us who are outside of Jesus Christ. And this is what it says. Jeremiah 2, beginning in verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for which does not profit be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked and utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So as the prophet is writing what the word of the Lord has come to him to say to the people, he says, have, has this nation changed its God and God declares, even though there are no other gods. Why is that? Anybody have a clue? Who is the only God? God Almighty. Yahweh, the living God. There is no other God. What were the children of Israel doing? They were worshiping idols, other gods. Now, you might say, well, Brother Jonathan, I, I don't bow down to a statue or whatever. No, you may not, but maybe you bow down to sports, or maybe you bow down to family, 
or maybe you bow down to the TV, but there are all sorts of idols. An idol is nothing more than what we give our attention and our allegiance to above God. And so these people had a problem, and God says, have you changed who your God, who your heavenly Father is, even though there is no one else? Because you've exchanged glory for which does not profit. In other words, you've given up the best thing for something that is of no use whatsoever. It has no profit. And so God declares, oh, heavens, be appalled and shocked and be desolate. Because here's what my people have done. They've committed two evils. The first evil is they have forsaken me. And what does he declare of himself? What is he? A fountain of what? Living water. We, the people have committed two evils. They've forsaken the one who is living water. Now, now put your play, your, yourself in the place of Israel as they've been wandering through the desert and they go into the promised land and they turn from God and they're kicked out. God expels them and sends them into captivity and they've had all this calamity and they have forsaken the one who is the life-giving water. Jesus says, be full of joy, be blessed if you hunger and thirst for who? The living water. Jesus Christ, God incarnate. But they have forsaken. You see, friends, that's where we're all at. That's all of us outside of Jesus Christ. We have forsaken God. Even if you believe that there is a God, so what? The enemy, the devils, it says in Scripture, the demons believe that too, and they tremble. But we've forsaken God. We've rebelled against God. We've committed treason in our depravity and our rebellion against him. We've forsaken the fountain of living water. And what have we done in its place? Hewed out cisterns for ourselves. We've dug our own wells, essentially, is what he's saying. We've tried to come up with our own water. What is that called in the Bible? Not God's righteousness. We're not seeking after that. What are we seeking after? Our own. We've become self-righteous. We've tried to do it on our own. We've forsaken the fountain that gives life everlastingly and abundantly. And we've tried to dig out our own wells to produce our own water. And it says of them that they're broken and they don't hold water. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for true righteousness, for they will be satisfied. But the Bible says our problem is... We've forsaken the living water, and we've gone after our own, even though it doesn't produce and it's broken. What a mess we're in, right? What a mess that is. But you see, we, we don't have to stay there. We don't have to remain there. Flip over uh, to, to Psalm 42. There's a reality that can change. In Ezekiel 36, I've shared this with you many times, God says to the prophet, he's prophesying about things to come in Christ, and by the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm going to remove from you a heart of stone. I'm going to replace it with a heart of flesh that beats for me. I'm going to put my spirit in you, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will then do the things that I've commanded you to do. You will love me. You will follow the things I do. And so when that occurs, this could be true of us. What the psalmist writes in Psalm 42, beginning in verse 1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. We can cry out in Christ, just as the psalmist did. That because you've made me new, because you've given me a new heart, because you've placed your spirit within me, just as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for thirsting of God, the living God. Doesn't that sound a lot like the fountain of living water to you? It does to me. Just as a deer pants for water, our souls, because God has changed us, he's made us anew, our souls thirst and desire. We have an intense longing for righteousness of Christ, an intense longing for the living water that is of God. Look at uh, Isaiah 55. We have an invitation. We have a problem. We've forsaken God. We've tried to do it our own way. We've tried to produce our own water and it doesn't work because they don't hold water and they're broken wells. But we have an invitation because of the compassion, because of the love, because of the mercy and grace of our great God. 
Hosea 55, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. God calls out in compassion and says, I know that you're looking for something that does not satisfy. I know that you're trying to do it, but let me tell you, I have water that brings life, and it brings it eternally, and it brings it everlastingly, and it brings it abundantly. Come, every one of you who thirst, every one of you that have longing, come to the living water. God calls us to himself. He offers us to come to him. Even though we've built cisterns and we've forsaken him, he says, I've still got it. You come. You come receive of me. So back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed, full of joy are you when you have intense longing for Christ, who is the bread of life and who is the living water, for you will be. Do you notice it doesn't say that you might be or that you can be? What is it? You will be. It is a promise of God. If you come to Jesus Christ, you will be satisfied. Isn't that wonderful, church? Don't you rejoice in that? I guess not. Isn't that wonderful, church? Don't you rejoice in that? Yes. Amen. When we come to Jesus, we are full and we are satisfied. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 4, just to give you a little background of what's going on here. Uh, Jesus has been uh, preaching. He's been, you know, with his disciples, and they've been baptizing those who have come to Christ. And, and he's actually been doing more baptisms than John the Baptist, and the Pharisees are taking note of this, and they're, they're kind of concerned with what's going on. And so Jesus decides, not because he's afraid of them, but just because he's sovereign and he knows what he should do, and he's surrendered completely to the will of his father. He decides to leave Judea and he goes to Galilee, but in order to go from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, he has to pass through Samaria. And so that's where we pick up in 4 verse 4. And it says he had to pass through Samaria. And so he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, weary as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour so in their time frame, the sixth hour to us would be around noon. So in the heat of the day, Jesus has been traveling. Does he have a vehicle, friend? No. Does he have a donkey or a horse that he's riding? No. How is he getting there? Walking. That's a long journey from Judea to Galilee. And he's walking in the heat of the day around noon, and he gets to this place where uh, Jacob's well is. He had given it to his son Joseph, and he sits down, and it says in verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, this might come across to you as no, nothing of any great significance, but if you know Jewish history, who did they hate? The Samaritans. And if you know Jewish history, especially if you're a rabbi, are you allowed to talk to the enemy? No. Why? Because it makes you unclean. The second part of that is it's a woman, and she's by herself, and Jesus is by himself, and then this time, that was not a practice that was ever done. You didn't speak to a woman who was there by herself. You didn't do that. And so Jesus not only is talking to the enemy, but it's an enemy woman. And so this would have been of great significance to the ones who are listening to this story. He says to her, give me a drink. Now, what kind of drink was Jesus looking for? Just a, a physical drink. It says that he was weary, he was hot. He had been traveling, and he's looking for something to drink to uh, satisfy uh, his flesh and his thirst. But he's going to turn it into something spiritual. Look at verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? So we see there that she recognizes that this is off, that this doesn't seem right. And, and so she's asking this question. It says, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So what is living water according to Jesus right here? It's okay, speak up, you say. If you knew what? The gift of God. Living water from Christ is a gift of God. What do we call that? Grace. Something that we get that we do not deserve. God's grace to us is living water. It is his gift. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew what God wanted to give you, if you knew who was before you asking you for a drink, you would not even recognize that. You would not begin to attempt to draw up from a well that's not going to satisfy you and indeed say, I would rather have living water from you. Listen to her response, verse 11. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? So she's still looking at it in the physical. You don't have a bucket to draw it with. Look how deep this well is. And she's still thinking in terms of physical water that will not satisfy. But she does ask, where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank it himself and did his sons and his livestock? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be what? Thirsty again. This water that's in this well will not satisfy. You will not be full of it. No matter how much or often you drink of it, it cannot quench your thirst. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But, now I've told you many times when scripture says but, it's usually a negative thing, right? But today, this but gets to be a positive thing, a, a hallelujah thing. But, whoever drinks of the water that I give him, who's given the water? Jesus will never thirst again. You catch that, church? You take of the water of this well, this broken cistern, and you're going to thirst again. It will not satisfy. It will not quench. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them, your thirst will be quenched. How long? Forever. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, who have an intense longing for Jesus because they're going to be satisfied. Do you see the picture of the Bible changing now? Do you understand what Jesus was saying as he was preaching to the people? Have Be full of joy. Blessed are you if this is true of you. The water that I give them will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So if you take of Jesus, if you partake of his living water, it bursts in us something. It develops something within us, a spring of living water that wells up to eternal life. What do you think that's representative of? It starts with an S. No. It comes from him, part of him. Holy Spirit. When we take and something dwells in us that gives us life, I think Jesus even says this. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, turn to John chapter 7. We'll begin in verse 37. John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37. This is what Jesus said. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So if you are thirsty, if you are parched, if you're in need of something to drink, Jesus says, come to me. Isn't that what the prophet Isaiah said? Come, you who are thirsty, come to the waters. The invitation is there. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. Now this he said about who? Read it. It's okay. Now this he said about who? The Spirit. I want you to see it. I want you to know that this isn't the preacher standing here giving you my opinion. These are the words of God. These are the words of Christ. Jesus says, out of our heart will flow a, a river of living water when we come to him, when we believe in him, when we partake of his righteousness. And he says these things, this flowing uh, spring of living water that he speaks about the Holy Spirit in us. Back to John chapter 4 as we close up. The 
the end of verse 14. I want to read it one more time. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You see, friends, a true drink of the living water, though it be we come to him and we drink of it, it produces in us water that is substantial for life, for the rest of our life. If you drink of me, Jesus said, you will what? Never thirst again. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Last verse of scripture that we're going to look at, John chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 53 as we close this out. So how do we partake of this righteousness, this intense longing that we go after the righteousness and we'll be satisfied? How, we know that's Jesus. How do we partake of him as the living bread and as the living water? How do we come to him and do this? Jesus gives us the answer here in John chapter 6, verse 53. Joe, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, and I told our kids at camp this week, whenever you see the words truly, truly, or very, verily, however your scriptures lay it out, Jesus is bringing important significance to that when it's repeated He's saying, this is very important. I don't want you to miss this. So truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. That is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread of the fathers ate and they died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, I hope you understand that Jesus is not saying he literally wants you to eat his flesh and literally wants you to drink his blood. But we have an imagery of that in Scripture, don't we? The Lord's Supper. What does he say? He's talking about a new covenant. And we, we do it through the Lord's Supper. And what is that a picture of? Take this bread that is broken for you. It represents my body. Take and eat of the sacrifice that I'm going to make. And take this cup that is of the new covenant and drink it. It represents my blood that is going to be poured out for you. What does the Lord's Supper represent? It represents us forsaking our old life, coming to Jesus for a new life and a new covenant and surrendering all to Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness because they're going to be satisfied. They're going to be filled. They're never going to be hungry again. They're never going to thirst again. That is the truth of the gospel. That is the reality of God's word. Friends, now let me ask you this on the converse. If we hunger or thirst for anything else, what is that going to lead? Empty, hungry, and thirsty. Nothing else will satisfy. What are you intensely longing for today? The things of this world or the things that are above? The bread and water of this life or the living bread and the living water that will always, always, always leave you satisfied? Amen, church? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this truth and this reality for this picture that we have throughout all of Scripture, how it's so cohesive. We go back into the Old Testament. We read the poetry of Psalms, and we read from two prophets this morning about these things, and we see from the very words of Christ these realities in this picture, that if we long after you, if we partake of you, if we eat of your flesh and drink of your blood, we will be satisfied, and it's going to produce in us life that is eternal, that is everlasting, that is abundant. Because your word promises so. We will never thirst again. We will never hunger again. We will always be satisfied in Jesus Christ, our Lord. But we have to hunger and thirst for his righteousness. Only then we'll be satisfied. So, Father, I pray for all of us in this place that we would have such a desire, such a longing to pursue Christ in the things of God. That we would have a desire to run after his righteousness and be ever satisfied. 
Thank you, Lord, that you are the bread of life, that you are the living water. We give you all the praise and glory. In your name we pray.